Instead of relying on someone to manually scan an item which can easily be missed, we get a real-time constant feed of where everything is all the time, says Eric, Director of Technical Marketing at Williard. Imagine that for a second. Knowing exactly where your packages are without needing expensive equipment or complicated processes. Sounds amazing, right? All of this is made possible by information technology or IT which has completely transformed the way businesses manage their supply chains. From improving communication between suppliers and customers to automating tasks like tracking shipments or managing inventory, IT has made supply chains faster, smarter and more efficient than ever before. Let's move on to understanding what is supply chain management. Supply chain management or SCM is about managing how goods, information and money flow from one point to another starting with suppliers, then moving to manufacturers, distributors and retailers and, and finally reaching customers. The ultimate goal of SCM? Deliver the right products to the right place at the right time, all while keeping costs low and efficiency high. But how does IT fit into supply chain management? Now that we have a basic idea of SEM, let's explore how IT has become its back mode. IT is what powers the tools and systems that make supply chains seamless and reliable. It connects all the moving parts, giving businesses better visibility and control. Let's dive into some key IT components that are revolutionizing supply chain management. So let's start with the very first topic on our list, uh, which is EDI, which basically stands for Electronic Data Interchange. Right, so this basically means that the exchange of business information or the basic information uh, exchange that happens between businesses or organizations happens in a standardized electronic format instead of the traditional paper-based communication like invoices, purchase orders and shipping notices. Right, so the basic idea behind it is we are replacing the paper-based methods to a more electronic-based method through technology. Right. So let's look at this diagram over here. So over here in this image, we're comparing the two processes that is the traditional manual process and the automated EDI process, right? So as you can see over here, we have the buyer's uh, system and there are some uh, fax, mail or email and there are some invoices, purchase orders, basically all the documents that are uh, transferred between the two organizations happen in these particular formats, right? But through the automated EDI process, what happens is the buyer, uh, buyer's internal system auto automatically sends the purchase order and then the supplier's internal system just returns the invoice, right? So all these uh, processes in between like the mails, fax or emails have been eliminated, right? So this is how EDI simplifies the entire supply chain process through automating the task, right? So some of the benefits of EDI over the traditional methods are faster processing, right? Let me just write it down over here, faster processing, uh, fewer errors. So there are lesser errors through EDI, right? Since our uh, data flows directly between the systems without any intervention, like we discussed in this diagram. So the errors are automatically reduced. And then the standardized formats ensure the compatibility and clarity. Right, so over here we have some standardized formats, right, which are automatically generated through the EDI process. But over here we have the various uh, methods that intervene our process. So again, it uh, ensures more clarity uh, when it comes to EDI processes. So EDI, as we discussed, is used for many types of documents, but uh, the most common ones are the purchase orders, uh, which tell the supplier what a customer wants to buy and invoices, which are the bills for the goods. Right. It is also used for shipping notices like we discussed. Um, th these are basically uh, used to inform the customer that the goods are on the way. Right. So moving on to the next topic which is radio frequency identification device. Now this device is very frequently used in all the common places and I'm sure all of you guys must have come across this particular device. So this device is called the RFID or radio frequency identification device. So this is basically the smarter version of barcodes, right? We are all familiar with barcode scanners. So this is basically the smarter version of barcodes. Let's see how it works. So basically it uses radio waves to transfer data between a tag and a reader. So it is commonly used for tracking and identification and it is also used for contactless payments. So earlier what we had to do was uh, insert the card, swipe it or, and then enter the pin manually, right? But now uh, there is an option of tap and pay. So you can just tap your card and 
the transaction will be completed so you do not need to enter your pin anymore right so the tap and pay method has been introduced uh, with the help of radio frequency identification device now let's look at the main components over here so we have the rfid tag which is basically a microchip and an antenna right then we have the rfid reader this is basically uh, where uh, the signals are received and sent right the radio signals then we have a backend system which basically processes the data. So the reader scans the tag. Uh, a tag could be our uh, card or it could be any uh, sort of uh, device that we are trying to scan. The reader is a device and the reader basically scans the tag and collects the information stored in the card or whatever our tag is, right? So this is the basic process. So some applications of RFID are in logistics and supply chain, which is our main focus over here. So it is basically used to track the inventory and shipments. Then comes details. So it is also used to manage stock and uh, prevent theft. In healthcare, it is used to identify and model medical equipments. Then access control. So secure entry to buildings and events. So I'm sure many of you must have uh, the system where you punch your cards whenever you're logging in, uh, say your office or your colleges, right? So that is again an application of RFID. Moving on to the next topic, which is barcode scanning. Now, this is a very common method nowadays. It is basically used to read and interpret the data, which is encoded in the form of barcodes. Now, our barcodes are nothing but black and white uh, lines or patterns, right? So a device, which is a scanner, it is used to convert those barcodes into digital data. Now, these are not just random patterns or random lines, but they are actually uh, some encoded information, which is decoded with the help of a scanner, right? So it is used in retail, inventory and logistics. Now let's look at some types of barcode scanners. So we have handheld scanners. So these are basically uh, used in uh, retail, right? Most of the retail stores will have these handheld scanners where uh, the items or the products are scanned manually. So they're portable and they're easy to use. Then we have fixed scanners. So something like this, as you can see in this image, let me just zoom in for you. So as you can see, this is a fixed scanner and all you have to do is place the tag or uh, whatever barcode that you're trying to scan under it and you'll scan it, right? So this is used in warehouses or checkout counters as well. Then lastly, we have mobile scanners. Now, mobile scanners are again uh, used by almost everybody nowadays. So you have multiple apps on your smartphones which uh, allow you to scan the barcodes or you can even go for Google Lens uh, when it comes to barcode scanning, right? So let's quickly summarize what we discussed about barcode scanning. So it is basically a way to read the black and white lines or the patterns you see on products, right? So you can... Uh, use a scanner that reads these patterns and turns them into digital data, right? And it is used almost everywhere nowadays, like uh, retail stores, warehouses, and even hospitals, right? So that is it about barcode scanners. Let's move on to our next topic, which is data warehouse or data mining, right? So we'll be covering these two topics over here. So as you can see, a data warehouse is basically an entity that stores all the organized data, right? And data mining is something that extracts the useful insights out of it, right? So together, basically, they are the backbone of businesses. Let's look at it in detail. So as you can see over here, we have the three data sources from where we collect the data and we pro perform the ETL process, right? ETL is basically extract, transform and load. So basically, we're extracting the data, we're transforming the data. That is, we are performing the multiple uh, operations or processes on the data, like we're cleaning the data, we are dealing with the duplicate values and the n number of processes that uh, can be done with the data, like feature extraction, feature engineering and multiple processes, they're all done in the transform uh, process and then the data is loaded into the warehouse, which is our data warehouse, right? And then the data is stored in the data warehouse. Whereas in the case of data mining, the data is understood, data is prepared, then comes the modeling, then evaluation, deployment, or the business understanding, right? So this is basically how these two entities work together. So as you can see over here, data warehouse is a centralized storage for large amounts of structured data. It collects and organizes data from multiple sources, that is through the ETL process that we discussed. It is designed for analysis, reporting, and decision-making. 
whereas data mining is the process of discovering patterns, trends, and insights in large data sets. Right, so techniques like clustering, classification, and association, basically all your machine learning algorithms are used in data mining. It helps to predict the outcomes and make informed decisions, right? So once you apply the algorithms, you can uh, make predictions or you can forecast uh, certain insights out of your data. Moving on to the next topic, which is ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning. So Enterprise Resource Planning is basically a software system which is used to manage core business processes. So some of the places where ERP is used is inventory, finance, HR and supply chain, obviously, right? So uh, enterprise resource planning basically enables a centralized database for all the departments, right? It also has to automate the routine task. Now in this image, you can see these are some of the applications of ERP, right? In project management, in sales, client management, vendor management, CRM, payrolls, human resources, employee management, task management. Basically, it helps you to manage all the core tasks of any business, right? It basically uh, makes the entire process easier. So here are some of the popular ERP tools. Uh, one is SAP ERP SAP. So it offers some advanced features for large organizations. Again, which it is used to manage the task. Then comes Oracle NetSuite. So it is a cloud-based platform for small to medium businesses. Then comes Microsoft Dynamics 365. So this offers easy integration with the Microsoft apps. Then comes Odoo. So this is an open source and highly customizable platform. So moving on to the last topic for this particular video, which is transaction execution. All right. So as you can see in this image, we have a seller. So this entity basically provides the data services, uh, the goods, right? Then we have another entity, which is the buyer. So the buyer is basically uh, the person who receives the goods, services or the data after verification, right? Then what we have is a verification contract. Now, this is basically a smart contract or a computational protocol, which ensures the transaction is valid, right? So this is basically done through something known as zero knowledge proof, which is a ZK contract. So this is basically a proof that the seller will provide that confirms the claims validity without revealing any sensitive information. Now that we have understood one example of transaction execution, let's look at a uh, transaction execution in detail, right? So a transaction is an action or a series of actions that is performed to carry out a task such as buying or selling goods or products, right? So for example, you can say online purchase or a bank transfer is all an example of transaction execution. So let's look at the basic steps involved in transaction execution. So the first step is initiation. So this basically starts with a request that is placing an order, right? So whenever a client or a customer uh, likes a product, they are going to send a request that they would like to place an order. That is basically the first step of a transaction, which is the initiation. Then comes processing. So you need to verify and record the details. That is, you need to ensure sufficient resources, that is money, inventory, and so on, right? Then comes completion. So you need to finalize the transaction and deliver the product or the service. So let's relate it with placing an order on an e-commerce website like Amazon or Flipkart, right? So say you're scrolling through the products and you like the particular product, you will go ahead and place an order. That is the initiation phase. Then your order is going to be processed. That is, it is going to be verified and recorded by the seller. So once the processing is complete, your product will be delivered and the transaction is going to be completed. So this is basically how the transaction execution works. So these are the four principles that the transaction execution follows. So every transaction follows the asset properties. So asset basically stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So atomicity basically ensures that the transaction is fully completed or not done at all, right? So either the money is transferred completely or it is not transferred at all. Then comes consistency. This ensures the data remains accurate, right? Then for I comes your isolation. So the transactions need not interfere with each other. Right. So one debit and another credit should not interfere with each other. Uh, the overall bank balance should remain consistent. Then comes your durability. So the data should be saved even during system failures. 
right so these are the four properties the asset properties that transactions uh, follow so this is all for this video i hope you guys were able to get some sort of insight out of it thank you and see you in the next video